My name is uh, Ken Goodhope. Uh, I work for Intellius.com. Uh, we do people search and um, public record searches. Uh, we're located up in Bellevue, Washington. Um, that's between uh, Seattle and Redmond. And today we're going to talk about Hadoop. Um, kind of the, this is um, Hadoop more from the user perspective, not the developer perspective. Um, as people working on the framework itself. So there is kind of a, looks like I'm still a little quiet here. It looks like there is a, there's quite a few um, things out there. So if you, if you want a primer on Hadoop to learn more about it, uh, this sort of makes the assumption that you already know uh, what Hadoop is and know about MapReduce. Um, and so kind of to talk about how to use that most effectively. Um, if you're not familiar with Hadoop and MapReduce, then you still might get some benefit out of this to get a little idea of what can be done and then you know go back and dig in deeper and there's plenty of good information at apache.org for Hadoop. So let's go ahead and uh, jump in. So the way this is going to work today is I'm going to take um, what I consider to be a typical task that you do um, in, with data and we'll look at how you know we did that before having Hadoop and how then we can translate that into Hadoop and then what we can do to improve the performance of that task. Now I know this is definitely a typical task because this is actually one of the first things uh, we did when we um, uh, adopted Hadoop about a year and a half ago. Um, so this task we're going to talk about is um, a scenario where you have a large data set that you receive with a ba basically a baseline data set. And over time at regular intervals, um, the supplier of your data gives you updates. And those updates take the form of adds, deletes, or changes. So the original baseline is very large. The updates um, can be small to large depending on the type of data. And what our goal is, is we're going to try to apply all the updates to that baseline because we don't want to have a data set that where we need to query the baseline and then we need to query the updates to figure out whether or not the baseline is still current. So we want to turn that into one new baseline that is current as of today. Now how would we have done that before Hadoop? Um, and by the way, as I go here, if anyone has any questions, don't, don't hesitate to ask. And um, if I'm able to, I'll, I'll answer some as we go. Um, and uh, then there will also be a Q&A session at the end, from what I, how I understand. So originally with our single node solution on one system in the Linux world, we uh, would have taken those updates that we received and generate two files from them. Uh, one would be an add file and one would be a delete file. And now note that um, changes, records that are just um, indicating the update is having a change, you would make an add and a delete file out of those. Um, append that. And then to, in order to apply that to the baseline, we would simply do uh, an inverse join on the baseline with the delete file, um, keeping all records in the baseline that don't appear in the delete file, and then sort and add in the add files. And we would repeat that for all processes. Very simple. Um, works pretty well if uh, you don't have a whole lot of data and you don't have too many updates. Uh, simple solution. The updates don't need to be applied all at once. They can be applied incrementally as they are received. But, you know, the downside of doing it this way is, is that as your data set gets very large or as you have a lot of updates, and we did have one data set where we received about a thousand updates to it, um, it becomes very, very slow to do it this way. In fact, uh, the one that we were dealing with got to where it took about two weeks to run through that process. And like, we, like I said earlier, you could always do it incrementally, just apply them as they're received, but that also has the downside that as you go forward, if there's ever a failure in the process, um, those errors get propagated forward over time. So let's say, uh, you know, you're applying on a monthly basis and uh, one month, uh, the process fails and the deletes don't get um, taken out or the ads didn't get put in. So now you have missing records. And if you never go back, they just eventually 
that they'll never get in there. Well, two weeks is obviously not going to work. Um, we don't want to tie a machine up for two weeks for something that really is a very simple task. And so this is the point where we start looking at um, Hadoop uh, and seeing how we could um, re-engineer this task um, within the Hadoop framework and MapReduce. And as we go, um, we're going to go down a few paths on our implementation of this and see where some common mistakes might come in as we uh, start to do this. So what are some of our options that we could uh, consider? Well, the first one would be the simplest option. Um, we could uh, attempt to use a series of Hadoopish style joints. Um, if you've uh, downloaded um, Hadoop and looked at it, you'll find in the um, contrib uh, directory there is a uh, join code that's already been written. Uh, you can simply uh, take that and plug that in. Where we were using a bash join before, we could just simply use a Hadoop join. Um, the benefits of that would be very obvious. Uh, would have to do very little to re-engineer our process. Um, just replace it. Uh, the downside is, is if we had a lot of updates, there would be a lot of jobs to schedule because every join would be one job. Uh, very inefficient, um, and this kind of hits on a, one of our very first pitfalls is that some, a lot of times when people go to migrate legacy processes to Hadoop, it's been my observation that they don't really rethink the process they're doing. They simply take what they were doing before, insert Hadoop where they can insert it, and magic happens and they hope that Hadoop speeds things up. Well. Um, Hadoop is really great, but it's not magic. Um, often in those cases, uh, people will say, well, Hadoop did not help my uh, job get any faster, and therefore my job is, is not amenable to Hadoop, and therefore MapReduce and Hadoop are not going to work for my uh, current situation. Uh, really what we want to do is we want to find a different way to do it. And another way that we could do it is we could read all the data at once and just emit the current record. Now the pro of this is obviously that instead of having all those little jobs that do those joins, we'll have one job that will read everything at once and just emit out what should be blondes in the current baseline. Uh, a con, which is not really much of a con, is uh, that we'll have a little bit of code to write. Um, but no biggie at all. So let's take a look at what that might look like. Okay, so here's going to be our first attempt. Um, and you see at the top there, I've got this labeled as not the best because um, I don't want to, you know, this, this definitely works. It'll definitely be a lot faster than our previous strategy. But as we go here, by the way, we're not, I'm not going to be showing a lot more than just pseudocode. Um, as far as to, you Know, know how to use the Hadoop APIs and all that. That's all very, very well documented at this point. Um, and if you're just now starting with Hadoop, you know, feel very fortunate that it is so well documented. Uh, there was a few years ago where pretty much all you had was the Java doc. Um, but no, there's a lot of examples now. So here we're going to be talking more about how you use mappers and reducers, um, not so much how the uh, syntax works. Okay, so in our mapper, we're going to emit all the records with the date they were received in an update. And we are going to partition on the record ID, which means that every record ID will land in a single um, reducer on a single node, and every reduced process will see all records related to that particular ID. Now in the reducer, what we'll do is as we go through those IDs, we'll load up all the updates related to a key um, into memory. You could use a sorted map or anything like that. And once we do that, we'll figure out which one is the most current record. And if it's either an add or a change, um, we will go ahead and emit it. If the most current record is a delete, we won't emit it. Um, this strategy can be uh, implemented in either Java or streaming. Um, streaming allows you to use any language you want to use, anything that supports standard in and standard out. Um, one thing we'll need to do in streaming is we'll, we'll need to keep track of 
what the record ID is we're working on and whether or not it's changed from the previous record so that we'll know when we need to uh, do that little analysis and figure out which record to omit. Uh, like I said, this will work considerably better than the uh, previous solution, um, but it does have some uh, downfalls. Um, the the one the one pro it has is that you really don't need to know much more beyond Hadoop than you might have learned in the word count example. Uh, uh, nothing much more. Word count will sh you know show you how to use, you know set up a mapper, you know set up a reducer. Uh, no special uh, parameters or configurations will be necessary. It will just work. Um, the downside, however, is, is that it requires that you're maintained state. So you need to be loading all these these records into memory. And if the key space is limited, in other words, you have a lot of records that can apply to a, a single key, then as your time grows and your data set grows, you'll find that you're running into memory issues. You don't have enough memory to process all the data. So basically this, become, this is a process that is not considered scalable. Um, it will scale for a while, but you're just going to run into barriers where you're going to have to re-engineer it. And the dream is always, and the goal, is to have a process that you won't need to rewrite later if all of a sudden you have 100 times as much data. So how can we uh, improve this? Um, We can improve this uh, in a few different ways. Um, there's four areas that are really good targets to consider whenever you're looking at a process and deciding how to make it faster. Uh, the first one is you could use a combiner, and we're going to talk more about that later. Um, actually, real quickly here, um, you could use a special partitioner, a special comparator, or then some non-default configuration parameters. So. I kind of have these in order here of uh, where you might want to look first. Um, the combiner and the, the partitioners and the comparators will kind of really speak to how you might rethink um, how you're doing it. And so let's take a look at these um, in order. Okay, so what is a combiner? A combiner runs in the mapper and it's kind of like a mini reducer. Uh, it takes the exact same, um, in fact, combiners um, inherit from reducer. They can actually be the exact same um, code that you use for your reducer. The only contract they need to adhere to is, is that their input is what came out of the mapper. So if you, uh, you know, we're emitting text objects from your mapper, uh, that's what the uh, combiner needs to take in. And what they emit is the um, format that the final reducer needs to see. So if you had, let's say you're, you've had a aggregation type uh, program and you put a combiner in there and your original uh, mapper was emitting uh, keys and your reducer was uh, counting up those keys and emitting um, an integer, um, an writable, then you wouldn't want to put a combiner in there that read those keys and emitted an int writable itself because then the reducer will come along and it'll be expecting to read text and instead it gets an int writable and it'll complain that int writable is not of type text. Um, so that's what a combiner does. Uh, really the goal here is that it enables the early compaction of the data. Um, that reduces your network overhead. That reduces how much disk has to be written. Uh, that's that's really the goal here. Um, when, when you can use them, they're great. Uh, to get a little more understanding here of exactly where it's important to understand how the combiner works to, to know why and when you should use it. Um, as we see here, we see um, from Yahoo, courtesy of Yahoo, a, an example here of how the typical MapReduce flow works. Um, you see there we have inputs. Um, the inputs are split. Um, they are fed through the mappers. The mappers emit key value pairs. Those pairs are partitioned. They're sorted and then they're fed into the reducer. 
and then out um, through the output format back to uh, HDFS or whatever um, sync you might be using. Now here's where the combiner comes in. Instead of the map output going um, to the partitioner, the map output is it is partitioned, written to disk, and then when merges happen, um, you overflow the buffer, disk fills out. Those merges are run through the combiner, which is then repartitioned and sent out to the nodes. So here's, um, here's the thing that's really interesting about this, is that, that that kind of merge step that happens on the map side doesn't always occur. Uh, it only happens if um, you fill up the buffer more than once um, and it needs to then reread um, re re that output, merge those um, files together, sort them, and then that's where it sticks the combiner in. Now, here's the big pitfall of the combiner is, is that it is Usually, for most processes, um, in our experience, most processes we've used, it has been detrimental. Uh, the, if you're actually going to be running your miner and it doesn't actually reduce the key, um, the size of the data set at all, um, so let's say you read a file, uh, you read a record, um, you do a little munging on it in, in your reducer, re-emit it again, um, you're not actually reducing it. You're not you're not aggregating it anyway. So at that point, then the combiner just becomes extra code that has to run in the middle. It doesn't actually get you anything. Um, and what is worse is that if your sort buffer is set um, quite a bit lower than what's coming out of your mappers. The combiner may run many, many times every time the merge happens on the map side and you don't achieve any aggregation, so it's just extra code. The places where it does work very well is if you um, have a job that is aggregating. Let's say word count is a great example. That's a place where a combiner ends up saving you a lot of um, uh, time and disk space and network I.O. because on the map side, you can, you know, bring that data set down a little bit, you know, count up some numbers before you bother sending them to the reducers and save a lot of time. And really, in our experience, um, we have, we created one process that was designed to, you know, do, create, you know, deep stats on um, a data set and basically did a lot of counting and things like that. And that's about the only place we've ever um, really got much use out of a combiner. But the reason I mention it here is it's another pitfall because I've noticed a lot of times when people first start writing jobs, they see that option, you know, set combiner um, and think, oh, hey, that sounds like a good idea. I can't see how it would hurt. And um, just by default, um, put a combiner in the middle. And so you really want to think it through whether or not your particular task is um, appropriate for that. Now, there is another um, form of combining that we are going to talk about here. Um, and remember, as I mentioned before, that when the combiner runs is kind of dependent upon how many spills happen um, when the merging happens. And that's something you don't have a lot of control over. Um, and in fact, if your sort buffer is large enough and you never end up doing any um, extra spills, then you never will end up uh, having the combiner run at all. And sometimes you do have a situation where you have figured out that using a combiner is very ideal for your job. Um, it's going to save you a lot of time, but you want to control exactly how it is used. In that case, you won't use the combiner that comes with the framework. You'll use a delayed write strategy. And in a delayed write strategy, um, in your mapper, every map call, instead of emitting a value, you actually um, use, let's say, a hash map or something like that and write values to the hash map as you go. Um, and then in the cleanup or close phase of your uh, mapper, then you finally emit those values. So let's say like we're just counting the number of words um, in a, a document. So we have a hash map of all the words that are available and, 
and the value in the hash map is the number of times it appears. So, you know, we see uh, um, this, and so we increment the uh, hash map on this one time. And then finally, when we're done, we go through that um, hash map and just emit all the values. This uh, is very uh, low tech, uh, not, not too exciting, but it does give you complete control over how that process works. So, again, only want to be doing this if you do have a small key space and you're going to get um, a lot of compaction as you uh, run through that data. Now, for the job that we were doing, um, a combiner definitely is not going to uh, help us much because we're not actually aggregating the data. We, we are, well, in a sense, we are aggregating the data because we're only emitting the most current record. But the odds of actually any one of our mappers seeing all those records that are related to a particular ID is extremely low. That isn't going to happen until we get into the reduce phase because different records for the same ID will be appearing in different files and therefore we'll have different mappers that are reading them. So combiners aren't going to work for us on, on our, our task of uh, emitting a new baseline. Partitioners, on the other hand, let's just a little summary here of um, what's going on with partitioners. Uh, right off the bat you have the hash partitioner which just takes the hash of the key and does a mod on it and sends it to one of the reducers. So every key gets kind of balanced out between all the reducers. Every reducer will see all the records related to a particular key. Um, the keys are sorted within the partitions but not between partitions. The other partitioning we have is total order partitioning and you can think of this as a big sort between all your data. So unlike the hash partitioner that just kind of at random you know spread keys across partitions, the total order will set them in contiguous um, space. So let's say our, our um, key space goes from A to Z. So you would see all the A's and B's in the first uh, partition and all the B's and C's in the next partition and all the D's and E's in the partition after that and so on. And most of the time you don't really need to do that, but unless you have like at the final output of your data set, if it's very important that it be sorted, then you can use total order partitioning. The third partitioner we're going to talk about is the key field based partitioner. Now it's a modification of the hash partitioner, but it allows control to limit what part of the key is used for partitioning. So instead of taking the entire key and that becoming part of the hash, um, that gets spread apart, it will take just part of it. So let's say we have a key um, John Smith and we want to make sure that all Smiths show up in the same partition because our reducer is going to take a look at Smiths you know together and make some you know do some logic based on that and it doesn't want to have Smith over here in partition one and Smith over here in partition two. All the Smiths need to be in the same partition. So using the key field based partitioner, we can tell the partitioner to only use Smith as its hash. And, and that will then lead to all the Smiths showing up in the same partition. Uh, this is actually going to uh, be very useful for us on our updates and we'll see a little more later how that will work. And the only uh, thing here to note is um, this is uh, uh, sorting still happens on the entire key, um, and often this is referred to as a secondary sort. Uh, I have here a couple of the options that you'll need to set. Um, one is, is the um, output key field separator. The default is tab, and most of the time for us, like we just use tab. Uh, that will separate. So let's say you have John Tab Smith. Uh, that tells it how to separate the keys. And then the key, the text key partitioner options um, is what parameters tell the partitioner how it's going to, um, what parts it's going to use. And those are very similar to the um, sort options you would have in Bash. Uh, so it's for in case John Smith, we want to do Smith to be 
dash k to comma two. Um, that tells it to start with the uh, second field and end with the second field. Um, you can even get more specific and do, uh, let's say you only wanted the first two letters of uh, Smith, you go dash k to comma 2.2 .2, um, and that would give you the first two letters. So if you're familiar with sort, um, then that will seem very natural and familiar. Um, if you're not, uh, it's not too bad. Uh, it's, it's quick to easy to get used to. So something that goes along with the key field based uh, partitioner very well is the key field based comparator. Now this comparator does just like with the partitioner uh, provides you more control over how sorting is done. Um, different key, different fields within a key can be sorted, you know, just like in um, in Bash, uh, you sorted either reverse, numeric, um, reverse and numeric, whatever you want to do. And this is going to really help you out if it's important um, in your reducer what order you see records in, um, how that data comes through, that you can control exactly how you see it. And that's something we're going to see here very, very quickly. And the options you set are very similar to what the um, partitioners was. Uh, it uses actually the same one to define the field separator. Um, and the options uh, are again, you know, the dash k, one comma one. Uh, and the only difference is you say comparator instead of partitioner. So um, now we're going to see how that we could use the key field-based partitioner and the comparator for the uh, task that we had of updating our baseline. So unlike the combiner we talked about earlier that really didn't help as much, this, this one's going to help us quite a bit. Um, so making use of the key field-based partitioner comparator, we first uh, create a mapper that does the following. For for every record that it sees in the baseline and in the updates, it emits as a key, tab separated, the record ID, the update date using the YYY MMMDD format, and a maintenance flag. And that maintenance flag is add, change, or delete. You could either use the full word or you could just use A, C, or D if you want. Um, doesn't really matter. Obviously, uh, A, C, and D would be a little less data, so a little more efficient, but it'd be negligible. And once we have our mapper that emits those values, again, we have three fields in our key, tab separated. We then need to set up um, our options. And now, these can be the options we set inside of our Java code um, using, you know, conf.set, or these could be the options that we feed to our streaming job, um, exactly the same in both situations. And so first off, um, I have it here that we're telling it it's tab separated. That's not really necessary because it is default, but if someone is to be using a different uh, separator, um, this is how you do it um, right here. We're also going to tell, um, in the, if we're using a streaming job, we need to tell it exactly how many fields that it's using as its mapper. Now by default, streaming uses the first uh, field up to a tab as the key. So if we're doing a streaming job, we need to tell it no, use the first three fields that you see in a record, um, and then the rest will be the value. Now, if we're just doing this inside Java code, we won't need to worry about that. Now, for our comparator options, uh, we want to tell the framework how we want this data to be sorted. Now, again, remember that we're emitting the record ID, the update date, and the maintenance flag. So on our first field, we want that to be sorted ascending um, alpha numerically, alpha. And uh, on our second field, we want that to be sorted in reverse order and numerically. And for our last key, we want that sorted alpha, but we want it in reverse order. Um, the reason for this will become apparent um, very soon. And finally, the options, last options we want to set is we want to tell it to use the key field-based partitioner. 
and that we want it to only use the first field in its partitioning. The reason for this is, is that when you have that entire key in there and you're hashing on it, you'd be amazed if you actually sat down and did the numbers. Um, let's say you have 25 machines, each one running one reducer, um, although usually more than that, and you want to take the odds that you have three records and that they're going to show up, they have the same ID, and you're partitioning on the entire thing, including dates you received it, the maintenance flag and everything, what the odds are that they'll actually show up in the same one, and you get down to where it's just practically non-existent. Less than 1% of the time you actually get those records in the same partition. So if we tell it to just sort on the record ID, then we guarantee that all records related to, a, all updates related to a particular record all show up in the same partition and therefore the framework gets to see all of those at the same time and decide which one is its latest update that it wants to admit. So those options that we just set, this is, this is what a reducer would see. Um, in the first field we have our IDs. Um, we see that they're sorted. Uh, they're sorted alpha in this case. It doesn't really matter. Um, even though we just have numbers here, it wouldn't matter to us if, uh, uh, let's say this was uh, 1 and uh, 5 and 10. Uh, the 10 would come up above the 5, but that's not important to us. What's important to us is that it sees all the records related to each other um, in the same, uh, in the right order at the same time. And our reducer then does something like this. What our reducer will do at this point is as the records are read, it, as it gets called and the records are read, now if you're in the old API, um, it'll be one reduced call per record, so you'll need to hold on to a little bit of state there. Um, you'll just be looking for whether or not your ID has changed. Um, and whenever you see a new ID, uh, and the record is either a change or an add, you admit the record. Otherwise, you skip it. So in the case of our little simple reducer here, seeing about six records, um, it sees the first record, and it's a brand new ID because it hasn't looked at any records before, um, but it's a delete. So it goes ahead and skips it. Uh, the next record is the same ID, so it skips it. The next record after that is the same ID, so it skips it. Now the fourth record it reads, it sees that it has a different ID and that that record is a change. So it goes ahead and emits that record. Now the next record it sees is the same ID. Um, we don't emit that one because obviously, you know, at some point, you know, um, and I see here I have my dates backwards. My apologies for that. Uh, assume that that actually was an older update. Um, you. Uh, it would see the, uh, we, at some point we got an add, um, let's say had some particular information for that record, but later we got uh, a change for that record. Um, the old information was no longer current, and so we don't want to emit the old information, we just want to emit the new information. And the final record that it reads um, is a new ID, and it's an add, so we emit that. So in the case of these six records, um, we're only emitting two out of here, and those two represent our new baseline. Well, that's actually pretty fast. Um, works very well. Um, extremely scalable. It, it won't matter if we, um, if let, let's say today we have a, a gigabyte worth of data, and at some point our data set grows to be a terabyte, or a, while well, the day is only here for uh, probably uh, Google and a few others, Yahoo and others right now, pretty soon we'll probably all be dealing with petabytes. Um, if our data set ever grew to be that big, uh, our solution is still scalable. Um, at any one time, the only state our reducer is holding on to is just a record ID, and until it sees a different ID, it doesn't need to store anything extra. So it doesn't matter if it's looking at five records from the same ID or if it's looking at 500,000 from the same ID. That's no more additional state that has to be maintained. So this solution will scale for us uh, pretty much forever, uh, although that's always scary to say.
let's say though we get done and still not quite as fast as we want it to be. Uh, our data set let's say has grown to a terabyte and now we're uh, looking at it starting to take a little bit of time again. Uh, and by the way, um, as a side point before I uh, go on here to the other uh, type of uh, configuration parameters that are available. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, our single node solution when we were doing this kind of a task took about um, two weeks to run. When we first implemented this using a five node cluster that we were experimenting with, uh, the runtime went down from two weeks to uh, 15 minutes. Um, and that was to process every single update um, not an incremental process at all to look at every single update again and emit just the new ones. Um, another, another benefit to it was that the code was so simple that you knew that there, there couldn't really be any mistakes. Uh, in fact, when the data set came out the first time, we had about 10 million records less than we had in our uh, old data set that we were using as a baseline. And I had to go in and investigate why we lost 10 million records. And I was pretty sure that the Hadoop process couldn't have, couldn't have been the issue because the code was so simple it couldn't have gone wrong anywhere. And sure enough, yeah, the old process, somewhere along the line, maybe when an incremental update was applied in the um, past, uh, some deletes didn't get taken out like they were supposed to. So the new process ran very quickly and was more accurate. Um, and that makes everyone happy. So like I said, um, we've, uh, we've got this running that our baseline updating is about as fast as it can be, but we still want to make it faster. Um, so here's where we, we kind of dig into more of the, the dirt, uh, more of the nitty gritty of Hadoop and figure out what options we want to be setting. So the first off um, that we may need to look at is um, our heap size. Uh, the default that comes with it is uh, 200 uh, megabytes per task. Um, if you have quite a bit of memory available, um, I would go ahead, you can up that number. You kind of want to be careful here. Uh, you, you don't want to give it a lot more memory than it's going to need uh, because then you kind of run into where it takes, waits a little bit longer to do garbage collection and then garbage collection takes longer. Uh, it's that also, too, it's like you might just be using memory that, you know, could have been used for other processes because as long as it's got the memory, it continues to use it. But if you do run into a situation where, you know, you need more memory, uh, MapRed Child Java Ops is how you set that. Now, the next thing, next parameter that is one that will actually save you a lot of time is the I.O. sort buffer. Something that could happen, okay, so let's say the default is 100 megabytes, um, and let's say you are using 64 megabytes um, block size, but you have compressed data in your mapper. And your data actually is compressed very, very well. You have a lot of repeated values or not. So let's say for the sake of argument, um, you're getting about a 1 to 10 compression. So as your mapper reads that data, it decompresses it, and let's say your mapper is emitting every single value. There is no um, no filtering or anything going on. So you end up emitting 640 megabytes uh, worth of data, and your sort buffer is 100 megabytes. Well, obviously, it can't read all that data into the buffer it wants to sort it. So basically, it has to read about 100 megabytes worth. As it gets towards being full, it then spills out to disk, um, and then you know reads more, sorts that, spills that out to disk, um, reads more, spills that out to disk, then starts reading in uh, that data, those sorted files you had before, sorting them together. And this happens just over and over again, many times. So you're doing a lot of disk I.O. here. Uh, in the case of our um, job that emitted um, 640 megabytes worth of data, we could actually achieve quite a performance boost if we up the size of this sort buffer. So let's say we set it at um, 700 megabytes. Now all the data can be read in to, one, to the sort buffer all at once and then be just emitted out to disk at once. No writing it to disk, reading it back in, writing it, reading it back in. 
all happens at once and speeds up our task quite a bit. A couple other um, options that can be set in relation to uh, the sort buffer is the uh, IO sort record percent and this basically if you have records that have a very large key size in relation to the value the default is 0.5 um, which in most cases is probably right. Let's say you have a line of text and you're only going to admit you're doing an indexing um, type um, thing and there's one there's an example of that on the Hadoop website so you're reading in all the text and you're only going to admit one word per line of text um, then your key is probably going to be very small you know only one twentieth of the size of your value but on the other hand if your key is very large in comparison to your value then you're going to want to change this number to make it more reflective so let's say your key is about half the size of your um, uh, value then up that number you know significantly so that way you don't run into situations where your key buffer is filling up but your value buffer doesn't have hardly any data in it now the sort spill percent is an option that tells it how often as, as it's reaching the full point on the buffer where to start actually spilling to disk um, now if if you've really worked your numbers out and you know that uh, your mapper is going to emit exactly you know 600 megabytes worth of data and you've set the uh, the sort buffer to 650 megabytes then you might actually want it to go ahead and you know load all that in and not bother to spill but let's say that your sort buffer was only um, 300 uh, megabytes and you had 600 megabytes of data if your sort percent was set to um, 100 percent so basically it didn't bother to spill to disk until it had filled up the entire buffer then what will happen is is that while it's spilling to disk no further values can be read out of the mapper until it's done so by setting the percentage lower you are able to allow it to start spilling to disk before it's done reading values from the mapper and hopefully never get a stop where things are hung up waiting on anything the downside of course is, is that the lower you set this number the more spills you're going to incur um, creating so like I said earlier if we had you know 650 megabyte buffer and 600 megabytes coming out of our mapper we don't want that to start spilling if it wasn't going to be necessary to spill so this is kind of you want you want to do a little analysis on your data and figure out um, where you're going uh, as an example of the um, baseline we were talking about earlier uh, we have our sort buffer set up um, quite a bit higher than the default because we're using 128 megabyte block size and they're compressed so we're getting most of the time about 8 to 1 on compression sometimes 6 to 1 and so that tells you about uh, 700 to 900 uh, megabytes coming out of the mapper and so I think we've set ours at about 500 megabytes if I remember correctly um, so we don't get um, too many spells. Another thing you'll need to remember is, is that um, when you increase the size of the sort buffer, you also need to increase the size of the um, child ops, the JVM heap size. Because uh, obviously that number needs to be less than the, um, the heap itself. Uh, the final uh, option on this page is the IO sort factor. Uh, that is tells exactly how many spills to merge at once the default is 10 I think actually that's where we've left ours uh, but that is also a number that you might might want to play with um, obviously the more that it tries to read at one time uh, you can have memory issues uh, that one we haven't had much of a need to change um, but you know if you've tried everything else and you, you still want to get a little more uh, juice out of out of your job that's one worth looking at I think we've kind of pretty much already talked um, about this uh, everything on here
Okay, another factor to consider, and um, looks like we're coming up on time here, so I'll try to get through this because we we'll leave a little time for Q&A. Uh, small files and load balancing. Small files are bad. Um, so let's say we had our original uh, data set and, you know, we got updates uh, twice a week. Um, and those updates were only, you know, a kilobyte or a megabyte each. And so we created one file for each. This can actually really hurt the performance of our job because it causes um, map task bloat. A map task will, be, will read either one block of data or one file, whichever is smaller. And then one file that's really small only has one block of data. So if, you're, if you have a file that is two gigabytes, then you're going to roughly use um, 16 mappers to read it. But now if that two gigabyte file is in a thousand small files, then you're going to create a thousand map tasks to read that data. And for map tasks, there's always, you know, setup and teardown. Um, you can have JVM reuse turned on, and that'll help that a little bit. But there's still, you know, once a mapper gets going, you want it to read as much data as it can. So having a lot of little files in HDFS can really hurt your performance. So this is another thing you want to take a look at. Um, and like. Aim for mappers to be busy for about two minutes or so. Um, of course, that's not going to be possible in, in all tasks. Let's, you might have a mapper that's doing a lot of heavy lifting, and two minutes is not realistic. But if it's just reading data and emitting it for the reducer, um, two minutes seems like a good, good number. Uh, another thing to know about um, files and HDFS is that when you're writing them into HDFS, the first replica always goes to the data node that it's on, if you're writing from a data node. Uh, the reason for this is that it works very well for um, the framework itself. So as, you know, as reducers write data out, um, you know, the first copy gets to go local. That one's the quickest to write. Uh, since the data is being written on reducers all over the system, it's not an issue. But let's say you're pushing your one terabyte data set up into the cluster and you use one of the data nodes to do it, uh, one terabyte of that data is all going to land on that one data node and this just kind of reduces the ability to load balance. Because um, you have one, one node that's just all full, uh, it, it gives it less options. So never copy from an, a node. So, in conclusion, um, Hadoop, you know, if everyone that's downloaded Hadoop and, and gave it a try to find it, it really has good out-of-box experience. I mean, you set it up, uh, most of the time things just kind of work uh, right away. You're able to write a mapper and a reducer. Um, you're blown away by how great it works. But as time goes on and you really start doing real work, you find that... Um, there's a little bit more um, you need to learn about the framework and how to use it uh, to really get the most out of it. Um, so that's kind of the whole point here is that um, to really, you know, kind of rethink your t what you're doing um, and, you know, re-express your legacy processes in a way that works for Hadoop and then set the uh, configuration parameters and all that. And notice I, I did talk about the configuration parameters last because while those can give you an incremental improvement in how things run, uh, really rethinking how your task is structured will give you the most bang for the buck. Uh, you know, if, if you have a, it's, it's the same with any kind of complexity. If you, if you have an algorithm that's, you know, uh, n cubed, you know, Speeding up the processor a little bit, you know, or cutting down the I.O. a little bit won't get you very far. But if you can figure out how to re-express that as an N squared or even better as linear, then you'll speed up a lot. Um, and one final thing I want to mention uh, before we go is, is that um, at Intellius, uh, the uh, data that we uh, generate using Hadoop, um, we built some, a lot of APIs around that. And if anyone's interested in accessing any of those APIs, uh, please uh, come to um, our site, uh, com and create an account, and we'd love to work with you and uh, see what you can do. Um, and now, um, 
Any questions? I see we have a couple here. So, Ken? Yes. Great job. I just want to thank you. That was a, um, yeah, if you want to, we'll just make sure we get the questions over there on that notepad. And people, if you have questions for Ken, just uh, go ahead and submit them and put a cue in front of them so we know they're for Ken. OK, go ahead, Ken. Uh, OK, well, um, right off the top, uh, somebody asked, do these attempts work across NoSQL solutions such as CouchDB or MongoDB? Uh, to be honest, I haven't used um, Couch and Mongo quite a bit. I think Mongo might have its own um, solution in it. Uh, I might be thinking of something else. Um, basically, we kind of just deal with um, data right inside HDFS. Uh, we were using HBase for a while. Um, MapReduce definitely works with HBase. Uh, there might be some Couch um, DB and MongoDB stuff but we haven't made much use of it, so sorry, I can't really help you on that one. Um, Henry asks, where to learn the basics of Hadoop? Uh, just go ahead and go right to the uh, um, Apache Hadoop. And you'll see on my first slide, um, I had uh, the URL. You'll find there in the wiki a lot of really good information. One thing you want to be careful of is, is that you know, Hadoop is still young. Um, a lot of things um, continue to change. Not much of the information, I would say, is, is really super outdated. Um, some configuration parameters here and there might have changed a little bit. But always make sure, like if you do a Google search for anything Hadoop, make sure that you're getting the current documentation. Um, another great place to uh, get information is to go right to um, the user group uh, and send an email. Um, common user at, uh, I can't remember, um, just do a Google search uh, or I have the microphone sitting on my iPad so I'm afraid if I move it it'll make a bunch of noise. But uh, the, the user group is extremely helpful. I've, I've rarely seen anybody post a question and not get an answer to it. Um, most most of the time, and questions get asked, you know, repeatedly all at the same time. So don't worry about going on there and it's like, oh, am I asking a question that um, people already know? Inevitably, there's always so many new people coming into Hadoop that uh, if you have a question, there's somebody you know who learned it just a few weeks before who uh, is more than willing to uh, answer it for you. And there's also a lot of the people from Yahoo um, are on there and will answer a lot of questions. Um, okay, when, when you change your configuration parameters, how do you know the new value is better than the previous one? Do you rely on the time it takes to finish your job, or is there something else you can look at so that the new parameters better? Well, most of the time, like, if you are doing things like the sort buffer and stuff like that, to know that you have good numbers involves doing a little bit of analysis on your data. Like we mentioned earlier, you know, figuring out exactly how much data is going to be emitted from your mapper. Some of the other parameters, like you know, increasing the uh, the JVM heap size or increasing the uh, sort factor, how many uh, uh, how many spills does it merge together at once? I've always just kind of done trial and error. I I'm sure there's probably a better way to do that, um, but I always kind of like you know like to make the change and and go give it a try and and see what happens. Uh, you know, I'd much ra I'd much rather be uh, actually doing something than um, doing calculations like that. But uh, there's a few people I work with that probably cringe at that. That it should be much more scientific. Uh, is there a Hadoop user group in, at Bellevue? You know, I'm not aware of one right here in Bellevue, but there is a couple over in Seattle. Uh, if you go online and look for um, Seattle Hadoop user groups, uh, you'll find a couple. Uh, one is uh, put together um, by a couple of guys that you might run across. I'm, oh, I'm blanking on their names right now. Uh, must be nervous. Uh, but yeah, I do a little research. There's a couple of them. Uh, one of them I went to a, a 
uh, several times, um, and it's it, the group has grown quite a bit. Uh, the other one I've been meaning to check out, um, but haven't got there yet. But there's definitely a, a lively community um, going on, and it's getting bigger all the time. In fact, they just recently had a um, group meeting over um, at Amazon. I think they had a couple, couple hundred people show up. What kind of baseline tools will measure the speed increases with a conversion? Hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand what you, what you mean by that. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, sorry about that. Um, instead of writing a MapReduce job, can you instead have a hot I use Hive to select the updates using query language. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, in fact, we've been using Hive quite a bit, and really today, if I was actually going to rewrite that solution that um, I showed you, I probably would do it in Hive. Uh, the only reason I kept to that one is it was a, it was a simple scenario that was easy to grasp, um, and there was definitely you know I had gone through you know kind of my uh, journey and learning how to do things and figuring out how things worked, um, what to do and not to do. So I thought it made a, kind of a good lesson. But uh, no, Hive is great. Um, in fact, Hive has probably been, Hive has gotten integrated in probably just about every, most everything everybody else does. Me and, uh, me and a couple other people will write um, straight up, you know, Hadoop jobs, but most everybody at the company works with Hive. And we even have our boss that's uh, always writing Hive queries and all that. And, um, touting the uh, wonders of Hadoop. Uh, what kind of base, oh, that's still some question. Um, is that it? Well, Ken, I think you've got all the questions. Yeah, and the timing was perfect. So I just, that was, thank you. You clearly know Hadoop. <laughs> inside and out. So good job with the questions. I know it's a little bit like taking a test, isn't it? <laughs> but um, a, a little bit. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> I also want I I I thought it was great. And I want to thank everyone who joined us here today too. There was a lot of good information shared in the um in the chat room. So um Good resources there. So I just want to remind everyone that we will have a recording of this available and we'll get it out to you in a couple days. We may be slightly delayed by um, it's Thanksgiving this week here in the United States and a lot of us are taking the rest of the week off. So that may delay us. Uh, if that happens, just bear with us. And I also want to remind you, um, folks, that uh, we do have a let me close that out too. Our Strata conference, where I'm trying to get to the, uh, which is about anyone who works with big data will be interested in that. And that takes place next February. And this um, is just a sampling of the sort of things that will be talked about there. So you may want to check that out. And that's, that's about it. So thank you, everyone. And now I'm going to close out the, the room. Are we all done? We're done. I was just typing a thank you note in the chat room. Thank you so much, Ken. Yeah, well, thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Um, I hope it went well. Thanks. All right. Goodbye.